This brings me finally to our fearless leaders, Maureen McTeer and Marlene Smadu. Here, we really owe ourselves a pat on the back for our ability to choose amazing leaders. We recruited two of the hardest working people I have ever came across in this sort of a role. And I think it's important to note the unbelievable amount of volunteer hours they both put into it. Just so you know, these are not paid positions. So let me tell you that their belief in the importance of this work has been deep and completely genuine in their energy and time seemingly limitless. And they and the other commissioners, in addition to their commitment, have opened so many doors for us that will continue to serve us extremely well. Marlene is well known to you. Among her many leadership positions, she is just wrapping up her term as the Associate Dean of Nursing at the University of Saskatchewan and about to take on a role of Vice President Quality and Transformation in the Regina Capel Health Region. She will actually going to implement everything we say in the Commission. She is a former Associate Deputy Minister and Provincial Chief Nursing Officer, our former CNA President, and a sitting vice president of the International Council of Nurses, and just got re-elected by acclamation for another four years. Congratulations, Marlene. <laughs> Marlene, I thank you from all your nursing colleagues for the tremendous amount of time, energy, excitement, and insight you have provided to the commission this, uh, this past year. And there is an internal joke that going around around the three M's, Marlene, Maureen, and Mike, and they, I think, have kind of not really sure who they are at some times. And Marlene often get called Maureen, and Maureen often get called uh, Marlene. I think Mike able to kind of maneuver his name. <laughs> Let me tell you a few words about Maureen, and then uh, without any delay, I will hand it over to the two of them. Maureen McTeer is also well known to you, but not from the world of nursing until now. She is a renowned <laughs> Canadian, that's another internal joke, Canadian health and equality lawyer and legal scholar and educator and author and supporter and advocate of human rights and a brilliant policy and political strategist. Maureen, on top of the skills, your knowledge and the connections and the people of influence and your willingness that you have used to move this agenda forward is phenomenal. And we absolutely know that Maureen's commitment is just, it's not over at this point. This is the report we're tabling, but we are all committed to continue to move this agenda forward. And our thanks from the board and the nursing community across the country. Thank you for stepping up and doing this and it's been unbelievable. So thank you for both of you, and over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Judith, for that uh, kind introduction and for the idea that has germinated from Judith and others for the establishment of the National Expert Commission. And thank you to all of you for allowing us to present this uh, brief overview of our report to you because it is an action plan and there is huge expectation not just from the Commission members but from Canadians that it will be nurses and nursing organizations that will lead and take this action plan forward. We did present our report to the Canadian Nurses Association Board on Friday but this is where the action is going to uh, germinate so we are delighted to be able to have the chance to present to you. Some Très heureuse, Marlene et moi, d'être ici à Vancouver pour ce, pour ce lancement du rapport de la Commission nationale d'experts intitulé « Un appel à l'action aux infirmiers, infirmiers, excuse -moi, infirmiers, la santé de notre nation et l'avenir de notre système de santé ». Je tiens à remercier tous celles et ceux qui, ici dans la salle, mais aussi à travers le Canada, qui ont gentiment partagé vos idées, vos suggestions, vos propos. Et en particulier, j'aimerais euh, offrir un grand merci à l'Ordre des infirmières et infirmiers du Québec, 
euh, Francine et moi avons eu l'occasion d'aller voir la présidente et plusieurs de leurs membres. Et nous avons, comme vous pouvez le, le voir en lisant notre rapport, nous avons euh, pu réfléchir sur les recommandations et les propos qu'ils nous ont faits et qui apparaissent dans notre rapport. Uh, many of you will wonder why this commission was established at this time. And you know that the Canadian Nurses Association has had a long history of engaging in policy uh, development, implementation, evaluation, both at the nursing level, at the health policy level, and public policy generally. With the impending expiry of the 2004, uh, First, 2004 First Minister's Accord, there was an expectation among many groups that there would be a chance to influence a new accord, a 2014 accord. You'll know that that accord, in the way that people had envisioned it, will not occur. But that doesn't mean that the need for transformation, the need for us to be accountable for the dollars that we get as governments and as um, society for health, being accountable for what our outcomes are. And so the goal of the, of the nursing, uh, National Expert Commission was to really help to position nurses more effectively and be involved in the, in, in the decision making, in the policy making, and actually even in program and service realignment to get to the kind of health system that when the Commission started we had a particular idea around and it was absolutely confirmed as we went through the process of the Commission. And as Judith mentioned, while the accord in its uh, anticipated state is not going to occur, the Council of the Federation has really come together to say that collectively, in a pan-Canadian fashion, we need to transform the system. And we know that this report will be well utilized in CNA's work with that group. Our mandate uh, was established for us. It's on the screen. Uh, we, we acknowledge that over the last 50 years, we've established a strong acute care and hospital system, and we know that generally we respond quite well to acute treatment needs. But our people in Canada have changed, and so must the system. In fact, uh, one of the comments, I think it was Maureen who said, we have an aging population, but our health care system is also showing its age. It hasn't remained dynamic to respond to the changing population health and demographic needs. We looked specifically at people at risk, so we looked at our youth, our older and disabled populations, and we specifically focused on our First Nations, Métis and Inuit people, uh, and Maureen will talk about that shortly, uh, because it is a population that we can't leave behind, but it's also a population that nurses work with intimately every day and have a huge opportunity to influence that whole continuum of care. We also identified that given our demographics, we need to ensure that there is a national pharmacare program, a home care program, a palliative end of uh, life care program. These are necessary aspects of care. In 1984, when the Canada Health Act was uh, proclaimed, much of the care that we are now providing in home and other settings was provided in hospital and it was insured. And we need to say what needs to be insured wherever it's provided in order that Canadian health care needs are met. We were given some limitations and considerations and, uh, from the Canadian Nurses Association Board and we've met those. It must uh, maintain or strengthen universal access, must be grounded in primary health care, community-driven care, and population health uh, improvement, which you will see strongly in the report. We needed to use the lens of the roles and contribution of registered nurses in all categories, and that is not in any way to diminish the importance of working as members of interprofessional teams, but this is an opportunity for nurses, and we heard this from the public as a necessity, to come to the forefront and use our strength in numbers and our strength in competencies to actually bring about change. And we did respect jurisdictional members of CNA as well as the uh, legislated and constitutional powers of the various levels of government. So as Judith said, our report is on time. It's actually under budget. And we um, did address the Canadian health care and, and nursing in the 21st century. We looked at sustainability and affordability of the system. And we've highlighted the innovations that are occurring and that will need to continue to be developed, uh, implemented, and spread in order that this transformation occur. <clears throat> 
uh, Judith mentioned and introduced by name our commissioners, but Marlene and I decided, since this was such a wonderful team effort, that we would introduce them a bit more uh, in detail than um, merely naming them. Um, and so with your permission, I'd like to do that now, because it gives you an idea of not just who we are, but we weren't there to represent any necessary point of view or any profession or anything other than the fact that we were committed to the goals that had been set out in our mandate. And I believe one of the reasons that we have the report that we do is because we've had such a team of highly experienced uh, people working with us. You've heard from about Marlene and her brilliance and my brilliance. Of course, it goes without saying the two of us were brilliant. <laughs> but uh, we do appreciate, Judith, you reminding the audience before we began just how brilliant we are. <laughs> It's also wonderful when people stand before you speak because then you know they have to stand after or that shows that they didn't really like what you had to say. So <laughs> it's a double-edged sword, this standing before you speak. But uh, anyway, I assume it was because the board heard us and our brilliance on Friday and they just wanted to let you know that we were the cat's pajamas. But um, anyway, I'll um, begin with Sharon Carstairs. The Honorable Sharon Carstairs has just retired from the Senate of Canada. Yes, you can retire from the Senate. Um, and she has been, as you know, over the years, a tireless champion for hospice palliative care. She has the seminal Senate reports and research that has been done are thanks to Sharon Carstairs. And she was a senator since 1994 and a federal cabinet minister. And so, Sharon, would you please stand again and be recognized? Dr. Robert Fraser is, a, is the youngest, just look at him, he's obviously the youngest on our group, but he, during our time, received two awards, two rewards. One reward was his master's degree in nursing science, for which I'm sure you will want to congratulate him, but he has also uh, received the uh, American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year Award for his book on social media. And since being an author myself, Robert, I just want to put a plug in for Robert's book, which I'm sure you can find online since he only has about 15 websites that you can access. But he brought us an understanding of the technological elements that have, that are, have to be part of going forward. And so, Robert, would you please stand? <laughs> Dr. Francine Girard, has a dual uh, role almost in her life, in her personal life. Her full-time home is in Calgary and her part-time home is in Montreal where she is uh, uh, Dean and Associate Professor at the University of Montreal's Faculty of Nursing. Francine? One of the reasons we had to do this early this morning was that Vicki Kaminsky is here from St. John's and absolutely refuses to get off St. John's time. So uh, <laughs> Vicki is uh, president and CEO of the Eastern Regional Health Authority in Newfoundland and Labrador, the largest health authority in, that, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Vicki is with us on St. John's time. Vicki. And I have to tell you that there are a few fun little terms which unfortunately didn't make it into the report, but Vicky's was the leading one, which was that our mandate is to look at health care from sperm to worm. <laughs> we did have fun. Julie Less is a nurse practitioner in her home community of Fort Smith Northwest Territories. She's a board member of the Fort Smith Métis Council and a founding director of the Institute for Circumpolar Health Research and one of the most brilliant people I have had an opportunity ever to work with. Julie, would you stand and be recognized? <laughs> Dr. Siobhan Nelson is a leading nurse scholar. She's an author, a teacher, a scientist, and in the rest of her time, she's dean of the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. Siobhan. Dr. Charmaine Roy I met when I was the public member of the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Board, and she is a practicing obstetrician gynecologist in Brantford, Ontario, chief medical staff for the Brant Community Health Care Center system, rather, and just a brilliant all-around person. 
Charmaine. Heather Smith was born up the road from where I was born and uh, decided, had the good sense to move to Alberta. She is a registered nurse and the provincial president of the United Nurses of Alberta, Heather. You know Rachel, you know Judith, but you may not know Mike. Well, maybe you do know Mike, seems everybody does. But Mike is an RN, and he became the glue that kept us all together. He traveled the country, and many of you met him in this capacity. Would you please recognize Mike Villeneuve? <laughs> Mike, where are you? Two people are not here with us, Dr. Robert Evans, who is too ill to be here, unfortunately, who is the founding member of UBC's Center for Health Services and Policy Research. He has been a lifelong leader in academic work and an internationally esteemed health economist. He was very, very important to us. And Tom DeQuino, who is an entrepreneur, a lawyer, corporate director, author, and educator, and the former founder and chief, exec uh, and chief executive officer of the internationally recognized Business Strategy and Public Policy Council. He will be here later, but one of the things that's important, what Tom always reminded us of, that Canada's competitive edge relies on a publicly funded health care system. So it's important to remember that in that group of people we have some very, very strong allies. And finally, uh, in finishing, Donna Dewar, Joy Verona, our wonderful staff. I see Joy at the door, probably waiting to race off, and I don't know where Donna is. But Senka Pivik and Lori Sarani, who isn't here because she's just had a little baby girl, um, uh, were wonderful. We could not have done it without you. Thank you very much. So quickly, how did we work? We had quarterly meetings of our commissioners. We did background research. Some of the researchers, of the, some of the three researchers you will hear as speakers at this conference. We had public polling done by Nanos. We had written submissions, many of which came from you, uh, it, the women and men in this room. We did a series of roundtables in conjunction with the YMCA Canada, which was a wonderful experience. We consulted with, pub, with the public, with nurses, with other care providers, with government leaders. And you will be able now on the website to have access to all of that information for your personal use, but also for your educational and teaching purposes as well. You can see from the map some of the places we went to. And my number one rule is if you can avoid flying, you should avoid flying. So we had a wonderful time. Um, Mike was my cushion most of the time as I kept my eyes closed and hoped I wasn't going to crash. So... Uh, <laughs> Basically, we had a wonderful um, time, but it gives you an idea just how big Canada is, which most of you know, but just some of the uh, ground we covered. Alors, les propos que nous avons entendus au, euh, un peu partout se limitent vraiment, nous allons se limiter seulement à quatre de ces propos. En premier lieu, les infirmières, nous avons été, euh, ça nous a été répété à maintes reprises doivent prendre la direction de la transformation du système de santé. C'est quelque chose à laquelle je pense c'est absolument essentiel que vous, vous soyez au courant que les attentes sont que c'est vous qui êtes, être le, le chef de file dans tout ça. De plus, les infirmières doivent se concentrer sur les déterminants sociaux, économiques, environnementaux et autochtones de la santé. Quelque chose que nous allons retourner euh, avant la fin de notre présentation, mais quelque chose qui est très, très important. La troisième, euh, pro, le troisième propos que nous avons souvent entendu, c'était le fait que les Canadiens et les Canadiennes veulent que nous ayons une promotion beaucoup plus aiguë des modes de vie sains. Comment pouvons-nous rester, devenir, retourner à une santé? Et finalement, c'est quelque chose pour vous. Je, euh, vous devriez absolument s'assurer que vous affirmez et que vous défendez la promotion des droits de, des infirmières et des infirmiers. So, um, how come I have so much to say here, Marlene? We're supposed to be this up fairly. We mentioned the social determinants of health, and it'll be repeat itself because, and we'll come to it when we talk about better health, but we felt we needed, and with um, you know, Julie's 
guidance as we met as commissioners, we realized that we wanted very much to speak about Aboriginal health, but we also wanted to do so in a global way because there is no group in Canada that is more affected by the social, economic, environmental, and um, uh, uh, Aboriginal determinants of health, which include issues of poverty, of social exclusion, of housing, of clean water, and of um, sustainable food. We, there is no group more than Aboriginals. And so we thought, how can we create a round table to do this? And we were most fortunate to find in Her Excellency Sharon Johnston a champion for that. And Sharon, uh, Her Excellency agreed that she would do a round table at Rideau Hall, which she did for us on March 27th in conjunction with the Canadian Nurses Association and the National Expert Commission. And we had um, uh, 28 people from across Canada who were experts who came to discuss Aboriginal health in three contexts in the social, economic, environmental, and, in, and indigenous determinants of health, chronic diseases, which all of you know are absolutely an essential component of health and health uh, decision making going forward, and relationships, which is a particularly uh, important part of Their Excellency's um, mandate uh, with respect especially to children and families. And that's especially important that we did it with respect to Aboriginal health because it is the federal government that is responsible for Aboriginal health under the Constitution, the health of, of um, uh, Inuit, First Nations, and Métis people. And it is essential that when we remember that, the federal government cannot walk away from its responsibilities. So this allowed us an opportunity to, uh, to put a focus on this. And finally, because we know that it is nurses, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, who offer the bulk of the care to Aboriginal people in their communities across Canada and increasingly in urban centres where they are clustered. Early on, the Commission chose the organizing framework for our work in our report that was established by the, Internet, uh, by the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and it's called the Triple AIM Initiative, where you focus on better health, all of the social determinants, the, the upstream components, focus on better care, the system issues, and better value simultaneously and in an integrated fashion. And we added the lens of best nursing because this was a Canadian Nurses Association report. The Council of the Federation has also been using this framework and their fourth piece is better teams. And we don't disagree with that and we know that best nursing means better teams. So that's really the framework that we used. So what did we hear? What were some of our findings and our messages? Well, the need for change was apparent. Um, to meet 21st century health needs, we need new models of organizing and funding our health care. We set out to learn what the models of delivery would be, and we, did not, we do not prescribe one specific model, but we did conclude that the model we chose and the models, perhaps in different contexts, must offer several of the elements that you see on the screen. We need to be centered on what individuals and families need, rather than on how providers and organizations want to function. So we need to make this a patient and family-centered system. We need to treat the individuals as whole persons rather than body parts or problems. We need to broaden the healthcare system uh, beyond hospitals and other institutions to offer more care appropriately in the community and at home. We do need to address the social, economic, environmental, and indigenous uh, determinants of health, uh, which Maureen has spoken about. And our research synthesis showed us that if, of all of them, if we could focus on poverty, housing, food insecurity, and social exclusion, all of which nursing has a, a, a tremendous role to play in, particularly the social exclusion, that we could have a big impact on improving health. Our model also needs to draw upon the progress made in Canada in, to develop public health and population-based policies and programs to ensure the greatest possible health outcomes for all Canadians. Judith called to you earlier about the need for governments, federally and uh, provincially territorial, to be engaged in public policy that makes the environment healthier, that makes the society healthier is absolutely key. 
we need to ensure that all health uh, professionals, including nurses, work to their full scope of practice, and we should be financed by public health insurance, but monitored for effectiveness and efficiency. We need to be accountable for the money that we spend. So we had the mantra of better health, better care, better value, all seen through the lens of best nursing. So let's look at better health. The uh, most of good health, we were told, our research showed us, and continues to show, as a matter of fact, most of good health comes from factors that have nothing to do with health care. Social, economic, environmental, and indigenous factors drive individual and population health in Canada. And some people we know in our country are at added risk, young people. We've heard so much recently about teen suicide, for instance, some of the mental health issues, older Canadians, Aboriginal peoples, new immigrants, the disabled, housing, income, food insecurity, clean water, social exclusion. There are four major determinants that generate and reproduce health inequality over the life there's something about which we need to do something. The OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development data, tells us that it is the ratio of social service expenditures to health service expenditures that's associated with better health, not the raw dollar amount that we spend on health care each year. You'll hear uh, from Dr. Gina Brown tomorrow, uh, but you know she did one of the research papers for us, and you will see from her research, which is available online, uh, a more detailed discussion of that. She wrote that it is the ratio of social service expenditures to health service expenditures that it is, is associated with better health, not the amount spent on health care. To address population health needs at cost levels that we can sustain, because obviously cost is a factor in all of this, Canadian governments, we believe, must radically transform the programs and the services they fund with public money across society. Attention to these factors is essential, the Commission found, to resolve the health and social disparities experienced by Aboriginal peoples and by other Canadians who are in vulnerable situations. Better care is the second part of the Triple AIM initiative and most of us as nurses work in institutional and often acute care settings. So we know that there are lots of nurses who are in those settings to bring about transformation. We need to look at wait times and access and safety and quality and the communication that needs to happen between providers and between families and uh, individuals and providers patient-centeredness and, and, and flipping the system around so that it actually is a streamlined journey for our patients. And of course, uh, all technology, but particularly electronic health records. Uh, when the president from Estonia was the chair of the uh, European Union Task Force, Force on eHealth, he concluded that in healthcare we lag at least 10 years behind virtually every other area in the implementation of IT solutions. And even at our table, uh, Rob Fraser was introducing us to new opportunities with existing technology virtually every day. So we have no excuse not to be using technology appropriately for safety and quality for our patients, for us being able to access the information that we need, and ensuring that our valuable human resources are being used uh, most appropriately with all of the supports in place. So in better care, we want to ensure that the system is expanded to include prevention of illness and injury and promotion of health and wellness. How many years have we been saying that? We need to do it. We need to act on it. And that's us as nurses and the nursing organizations. We also agreed as a commission that we need to provide the supports for people to be able to take more personal responsibility for their health. No one wants to be sick. We want to be able to engage and educate and inform and support so that people can be their own, quotes, CEOs of their own health care and their own health. And obviously we need to improve quality of life and death, and we have significant pieces in our report regarding the care of our elderly and the care of palliative care. You will note that we are not inclined to call for more doctors and nurses at this time. We believe that we need to do everything we can to fully deploy the full scope of all of the people in our system first, have them working in teams so that the care and services are integrated, 
and seamless for patients and their families. And we must move beyond episodic, urgent, and acute care only. That is necessary, but that can't be the only thing we focus on to accessible, integrated services and programs. And if we base our care on the, on the foundation of patient and family-centered primary health care, then access and uh, um, having the right service at the right time by the right people will be a natural fallout of that. And, and again, using up-to-date technology, evidence, clinical practice guidelines, and best practices, absolutely key. So let's look for a moment at better value. That's value for the monies that we spend on our health care system and our health care delivery system. Last year, we spent $200 billion on health care. We have the world's sixth most expensive health care system per capita, control resulting in almost as much as 50% of some provincial budgets. And yet, even though we're spending so much money on an acute care hospital-based system, I, we note, we get a B grade on health outcomes and system performance from major international uh, indicators. In fact, in some, we arrive dead last on key measures, including quality and safety, some access measures, patient-centeredness, and of course, electronic records. Some who have experienced the system find communications internal to it, and I quote them, abysmal. Yet the commitment to and the investment in a national health system as is an important international determinant of health. Close to half of our budgets, as I've mentioned, are spent on the health care uh, um, envelope. Three quarters of that is spent on, on three things, hospitals and other institutions, doctors and drugs. But our increasing investment, as I noted, is not getting us better care. And that is one of the things we hope our report reminds people of. It is not being against an acute care system. It is merely saying it is not enough to serve the needs of Canadians as they exist now and will exist in the future. And that when we say the future, we're talking 5, 10, 15 years. Um, the um, registered nurses, nursing, nurses Association of Ontario in their report in their uh, submission to us said, and I, I'd like to quote them if, you, if I can, that continuing to fund acute episodic care at the expense of preventing and treating non-communicable diseases simply perpetuates ineffective, inefficient, and costly care. If we did nothing to pay attention, but pay attention rather to, to better chronic disease management, the Commission believes that we could essentially wipe out the worry about sustainability and where, other than chronic disease management, can we find a perfect alignment with nursing practice? We must do better within the existing system. We were challenged uh, very often by our commissioners, particularly our non-nursing commissioners and the public, about why change hasn't happened. Uh, Commissioner Roy Romano, when he did his report, said that this kind of transformative change will need political courage and that sometimes a lack of information is a block. We contend that there is no lack of information. We were able to access all of the information we needed. Uh, there was no new research conducted. This has been in the public domain for years. So I think it is about political courage, and that's small p political and large p political. And when we have 268,000 plus registered nurses that the Canadian Nurses Association speaks for, we can be a political force. We need to ensure that we use our role as nurses to work with the public so that they have the knowledge of health and health care options and about their personal responsibility for health. I think I said at the CNA board table on Friday, perhaps we want an engaged and an enraged public. Uh, that we actually work with them to understand that this can be better and that we were going to help them get there. And we recognize that funding models and, and ways that money gets exchanged and accounted for and how individuals get paid, that we need to make sure that the performance and the uh, services that we want to have are matched appropriately by the incentives in the system. 
So we spent a lot of time looking at best nursing and we were absolutely delighted to see the kinds of innovations that nurses are bringing, are already doing in their own practice settings and sometimes even on a regional provincial basis. But overall, we noted that nurses are underemployed and underutilized. So that we, we have to emphasize that there's a high expectation from the public that the nurses will be leaders in helping them to uh, get the care they need and to transform the system so it is patient and family centered. So they're telling us, do it, act, get moving on this action plan. Gina Brown is going to speak tomorrow, and I won't steal her thunder, but she uh, and her team uh, looked at a number of uh, nursing intervention studies to see where at least 50% of the intervention was nurse provided, and the statistics are up there. In 27 of these studies, there, the, um, the interventions were more effective, and in some of those, uh, it was at the same cost, but in most of them, it was at less cost. In seven studies, they were equally effective and less costly and in five studies, equally effective in the same cost. And I know Gina's gonna tell you about some very practical, you know, based on how much money we could save examples and talk about the better quality of outcomes that come from these nurse-led interventions. So now it's time for action. Uh, enough talking, as we, someone on our commission said. What do we propose? Where do we go from here? Nous avons proposé neuf actions pour la transformation du système de soins de santé. Je vais seulement les décrire et après nous aurons la possibilité d'en commenter chacun individuellement. Premièrement, nous voulons un top 5 dans les années 5, dans les prochaines cinq années. Deuxièmement, nous voulons accorder la préséance aux personnes, aux familles et aux collectivités. Troisièmement, Nous, nous voulons mettre en œuvre des soins de santé primaires auprès de tous les Canadiens et toutes les Canadiennes. Quatrièmement, nous, nous demandons un investissement stratégique dans l'amélioration des facteurs déterminants de la santé dont nous avons parlé longuement déjà dans cette présentation. Cinquièmement, il faut se soucier des Canadiens et des Canadiennes qui risquent de ne pas suivre le rythme. C'est bien beau de dire, eh bien, c'est de leur faute parce qu'ils sont malades ou parce qu'ils ont fait des mauvais choix. Mais c'est pas une réponse à laquelle on peut se fier. Sixièmement, il faut penser santé. La santé, c'est quelque chose qui euh, est partout, qui, qui, que nous voyons et qui est affecté par tellement de choses. Nous avons maintenant la possibilité de, euh, de le mettre, si vous voulez, dans toutes les priorités, soit économiques, politiques, etc. Septièmement, il faut s'assurer de la sécurité et des qualités des soins. Je suis certain que c'est quelque chose absolument important pour ceux et celles ici qui ont des pratiques cliniques un peu partout. Huitièmement, il faut préparer les fournisseurs de soins. C'est quelque chose à laquelle Marlene va parler, sans doute qu'il va demander beaucoup de, de, de discussions. Neuvièmement et finalement, je pense que c'est absolument essentiel d'exploiter pleinement le potentiel de la technologie. So we'll spend a few minutes on each of the recommendations, although there's full coverage in the report. So top five in five years, we believe that nurses have to be leaders in innovation and collaboration with policymakers, other health professionals, researchers and scientists to select five meaningful health and health system indicators and set national goals for improving Canada's ranking on them. We want to be in the top five nations on five indicators in five years. That's going to be our 150th uh, birthday present to ourselves. The Commission did not determine itself what those five should be, although you'll see from our report we've got some pretty strong feelings and we've already cited what some of them are. That things like safe, clean water in all communities, uh, access to affordable food and food security, uh, increase in physical activity, uh, and, and childhood obesity was one of the things that came up repeatedly. Um, issues of poverty and housing, issues of social exclusion, which in our nursing practice we can address. Uh, but we do think that the better approach is for CNA to collaborate with other groups, as it already is, that are also interested in transforming the system. So we have some collective efforts on five main areas and that we actually are able to move those dots. Our second action for transformation is to put individuals, families, and communities first. 
we need a world-leading model of care delivery that will achieve national goals through local solutions tailored to communities and to the people who live in them. Nurses should partner with governments, other health professionals and the public to move beyond our current institutional vision of health and ensure services that are patient and family centered, promote health and prevention, manage chronic disease, integrate all forms of care and provide better health, better care and better value to all Canadians. Our third recommendation is to implement primary health care for all. And for any of you that are as old as I am, we've been hearing this a long time. But we cannot no longer just speak the language. So we believe that uh, CNA should bring together communities, governments, health professionals, and social services agencies to, to have a concerted and collective uh, plan to move forward on implementing primary health care. Many jurisdictions are well on the way, many regions are well on the way. This is about getting to that tipping point and spread and sustainability and being accountable for it. We call on our specialty nursing uh, organizations with, that are members of CNA uh, to show leadership given their own particular niche of expertise and uh, helping to influence uh, public opinion and decision makers. And uh, we also believe that this is uh, that the primary health care has to ensure that we're focusing on, as I said earlier, the pan-Canadian supports that need to be in place. So access to medication and palliative care and home care, just as three examples. Our fourth action for transformation is to invest strategically to improve the factors that actually improve health. The most important measure we can take as a society to improve health is to acknowledge the impact of the determinants of health on Canadians and to strive to improve the conditions under which people live, particularly striving to reduce poverty, poor housing, food and water insecurity, social exclusion, which have the greatest effects on health. Our fifth recommendation is to pay attention to Canadians at risk of falling behind. We do need to focus resources where they are most needed. We need to think about the health and care needs of our vulnerable and marginalized people and our communities, and then focus some health resources where they will do the most good. Our First Nations, Métis, Inuit communities, uh, children, older Canadians, those with low incomes, disabled, and some racial and ethnic groups are often at greater risk, and nurses are with them, uh, working with them all of the time. We have a huge role to play. Our sixth action for transformation is, is uh, directed mostly at governments, and that is that they think health. We urge governments to integrate health in all policies. All governments should create processes, as they have in the economic sphere, to support healthier lives for Canadians. All proposed policies, laws, and public programs, as is the case already on trade issues, should be assessed for their impact on health before they are introduced and implemented. Governments should take into account the impact of all policies, laws, and pub that public programs will have on health as part of their process. This strategy could help avoid the types of situations that we have all seen in the past, such as dropping compulsory physical education from schools, for instance, despite the long-term effect on young people's health or closing mental health institutions without providing community services and funding for the people who are being turned out. Nurses must work with governments to establish processes that support healthy policies for Canadians and work with other health professionals across the board to research the impact of public policy on health status in Canada. Number seven is to ensure quality and safety in health care. And as nurses, we are a key link in the chain of safety, and we must be leaders in developing and sustaining a comprehensive national commitment to safety and quality in all of our health care services. One of our non-nursing commissioners asked, why does it get to be a choice in nursing or medicine or health care generally to not practice from the current evidence and using the best available information? And he went on to say, flight crews don't get to say, eh, we're not going to use the safety checklist today. <laughs> so we, we can't say no to evidence. We should think about having a national clearinghouse, and we're asking CNA to think about this, 
for evidence, innovation, and leading practices, not just in nursing, but in healthcare generally. We heard commissioners saying, well, gee, if they're doing that in PEI, you know, why aren't you doing it in Saskatchewan? And we didn't have an answer. We need to make sure that the best evidence and good practices are spread and sustained. And we are uh, absolutely committed that, that there should be incentives and opportunities for uh, those who are using best practices and creating best knowledge to be acknowledged. Uh, as Maureen indicated, I, I, we also have a recommendation around preparing the providers. And um, an, a new system that we're talking about does need new service providers. That doesn't mean it needs new people. It needs all of us to be renewed. And we need to look at uh, the scientific information, the kind of research that we're doing that will help us to become renewed. We need to think about education and the kind of competencies that our new professionals are um, acquiring in order to be able to practice. Uh, we need to think about the regulatory frameworks, not just within nursing, but uh, in society in general, that may inhibit or pr uh, create barriers to the best use of all of our providers. New topics, new teaching methods, new science, using technology. Uh, and we've asked CNA to work with uh, the organizations that need to be engaged to move forward this preparation of providers. Our ninth and final action for transformation is use technology to its fullest. 21st century healthcare needs 21st century technology. We need an unparalleled escalation in our use of technology to drive a transformed healthcare system because properly used, technology today and in the future has the potential to do many things, including providing rapid access to evidence and best practices for providers themselves, to information and education for citizens, and tools for communication and collaboration among healthcare providers. And in a country like Canada, which has such a wonderful reputation with respect to telehealth and telemedicine, it seems a natural place for this to be done. But all of these enhance what all of you are most concerned about, and that is patient, patient quality, but also patient safety. Technology will also be a crucial tool for nurses working with Canadians to support personal health care responsibility whether that's working together to research healthy personal choices, organizing care by booking appointments online, or having nurses remotely monitor health data such as blood pressure and heart rates at a distance. Implementing health electronic records must be a priority. It must be accelerated to make health records of all Canadians fully accessible, portable, and interactive by 2017. Nurses can help government do this. And the Commission urges the CNA and all of its affiliates to establish and coordinate pan-Canadian interoperability and press provincial and territorial governments to get electronic records in place. Our report uh, that you will receive as a hard copy, but most people will be able to access uh, only electronically, and all of the supporting documents, and there are tons of them, are now available on the website. And I particularly call your attention to the little icons where when you hit on the television screen, you'll get a little video clip, and they're brilliant. You know, those sorts of stories tell, uh, those sorts of ways of telling stories have such a, an emotional impact, as well as the little clipboard, which takes you to some further information. Uh, we particularly want to acknowledge our partners, um, our main external partners, which were CHSRF, uh, Nanos uh, and Research, and Nick Nanos is actually here as part of the convention, uh, Mass, LBP, and YMCA Canada, who were instrumental in organizing our consultations, particularly with the public. I want to acknowledge the researchers. Dr. Gina Brown is here. She did one of our synthesis papers. Also, Dr. Carlos Muntane and, uh, from U of T and Dr. Stuart Soroka from McGill. Those papers are also available in their entirety on the uh, website. And on behalf of all of the commissioners, I would like to again thank Dr. Judith Shamian, uh, Rochelle Bard, whose leadership made it possible for this commission to happen and who participated fully on the commission, to the CNA board for its decision to move forward with this commission, and to all of you who participated in whatever way you did to provide us with information that could be synthesized and integrated into what we're presenting as our report. 
Uh, we would, as commissioners, we would also particularly like to thank all of the CNA staff, but particularly the group that worked with us uh, to keep us on time, under budget, managing all of our, our logistics. When you look at this in its entirety, it seems very daunting. But I think if we learned anything this year, it is that transformation is possible, but it's also necessary. Nurses, and I'm a non-nurse, so I guess that's why I have to say it, because you seem, and humility is not something law, lawyers know much about, so I'm always <laughs> astounded at how humble nurses are. So as a non-humble non-nurse, I will say that nurses are a mighty force for change. Canadians also, though, expect that you are going to harness the power not just of your numbers, but of the positive perception you have among the public to act to transform the system. We have come down in our report firmly on the side of large-scale transformation to, to transformation to service delivery and to care that allows, that above all, is focused on the needs of Canadians and their families, on high-functioning teams as opposed to solo practices, teams whose members are working to the full scope of their practice and using the most current and useful technology. We came down on the side of proactive, safe, affordable health promotion and treatment services as an integral part of the healthcare system. Services that are informed by evidence and delivered in timely ways in communities and in places where Canadians live, work, learn and play. It's been a delight for me to be part of this and I thank you for that opportunity and this is our report. We present it to you. Thank you. Thank you. I was whispering in Maureen's ears that this is just the beginning. And her comment is, yes, I know, you keep saying so, it makes me nervous. <laughs> but the truth is that nothing makes neither Maureen nor Marlene nervous. They have really charged ahead with it, with the commissioners. And we had kind of a debrief last night and success happens when you have an amazing group of men and women that come together for the same value of a healthcare system and an incredible group internally that supports them. So now you know why I am just so excited about the commission's report. And I'm so confident that this barb comes into my role and the board that will be working with her will just be pulling and pushing to make sure that they work with all of us across the country to make it happen. Thank you.